Okay, so I guess we can start. Um, yeah, so yesterday, uh, Professor Mutlu uh, covered some introduction to DRM, um, and today uh, we will be presenting some uh, recently published works uh, on DRM that um, improve uh, performance, reliability, and um, DRM from other aspects. Um, and we will be presenting four um, papers in total today. And um, we will start with this one uh, called Charge Cache, which is a um, mechanism for reducing uh, DRAM latency. Uh, so it is named Charge Cache because uh, it provides like cache-like benefits in DRAM, and it does that by exploiting charge variation in DRAM cells. Um, yeah, so uh, Professor Mutlu yesterday like told you like how it works, how uh, DRAM stores single bit information as a uh, like different amount of charge. Uh, but we will quickly go over those uh, just to remind you, and then um, I will explain how the mechanism works. Um, yeah, so this paper was published in um, HPCA in 2016. Um, yeah, so let me start with a quick summary. So the goal of this work is to reduce DRAM access latency uh, without making any modifications in the DRAM chip. And the reason is that um, it's difficult to change DRAM chips, right? So um, any changes in the DRAM chip, which is not like conventional CMOS logic, uh, may introduce all the overhead, um, especially if you try to add some uh, like logic. Um, so we have um, three observations, I believe, uh, that we uh, exploit to reduce DRAM latency. And the first one is that highly charged DRAM row can be accessed with low latency. So I'll explain here exactly what I mean uh, by highly charged and um, why is there is such a variation, why some cells are highly charged, why some of them are not. Um, yeah, and the second observation is that um, when we access a DRAM row, we restore its charge. And the reason is basically um, that a activate operation, which opens a row, is a destructive operation. And to put data back on the row, we need to restore. And this operation is essentially uh, like restoring a DRAM uh, row, uh, cells in a DRAM row, to full level. Um, even though initially, when we activate it, um, the, um, the DRAM cell has leaked a small amount of charge. When they are pre-charged, they will have, um, uh, they will be fully charged, basically. And the third observation is that um, applications that we analyzed tend to access the same rows uh, multiple times in a very short amount of time. Uh, so we call this observation row level temporal locality, or LTL for short. Uh, so basically when you activate a row, it's very likely that in a very short amount of time you will touch the same row, you will activate the same row again. Um, yeah, so based on those three observations, uh, we developed this key idea, which is tracking the recently um, accessed DRAM rows and using lower timing parameters um, if they are accessed again, because we know that they are highly charged. Um, so the mechanism is called charge cache. Uh, it, is, um, it requires very low cost uh, changes in the uh, memory controller and no modifications uh, on the DRAM chip. Uh, it improves uh, performance by um, 8.6 to 10.6 percent on average for eight core system, and um, lowers DRAM uh, uh, energy uh, due to um, improvement in execution time. Okay, um, so I will start with some uh, DRAM operation basics, and then we'll quickly go through the um, uh, mechanism. So here you see a, um, a DRAM module. So here we have, in this picture, we have like eight chips in this side. And um, inside each chip, we basically have um, DRAM cells that are organized as 2D arrays, uh, which are connected to the sense amplifiers over here. And those all sense amplifiers uh, form a um, row buffer. Um, yeah, and on this side, we have the CPU, which implements a memory controller. And basically, the memory controller talks to this DRAM module and sends a set of commands like activate, pre-charge, retry, refresh. Um, OK, so uh, let me walk you through a uh, typical um, read operation that's happening in DRAM. So let's assume that we are trying to access this DRAM cell over here. 
uh, yes, those are DRAM cells and amplifiers. And okay, uh, so we'll access actual SL in this row here. Um, so there are three steps of charge movement when we perform a DRAM access. So first, we need to activate a row that is um, selected here. So right after activating a row, what happens is the charge here stored in those DRAM cells flows into the sense amplifiers through the bit lines, and then um, the sense amplifier senses this uh, value stored in the DRAM cells. Right? So if you have charge, it will sense, let's say, one. Um, it is, if the cells are not charged, it will send zero or vice versa. So after sensing operation, since the uh, charge in the uh, DRAM cells is um, kind of destroyed, you have to restore it back to its original level. And so this is another um, thing that sense amplifier is doing. Right? So after sensing the value, it is restoring the, cell, uh, the cells back to their original value. And then finally, to be able to activate another row from the same um, cell array here, we need to pre-charge the current row. And yeah, this operation is basically called pre-charge and the memory control issues a pre-charge command uh, to do this. So let's see what happens during those three commands from um, the cells and sense amplifiers charge levels perspective. Uh, so here in this graph, we show charge uh, as a function of time, both for the sense amplifier and the cell. So initially, uh, the sense amplifier is pre-charged, which is like approximately half VDD. And then let's say uh, the cell contains um, charge which corresponds to a data one region, which could be either zero or one, depending on how you are interpreting that. So yes. and. Once we activate this row, the goal is to um, get the, um, the charge in the sense amplifier to ready to access charge level, so we can do actual uh, read or write operations. So when we issue the activate command, uh, command over here, the first thing happening is charge sharing. Right? So the cell shares its charge with the sense amplifier and raises slightly um, uh, the charge level over here. So at this point, the sense amplifier can uh, tell, uh, based on this perturbation over here, whether the data is zero or one. So in this case, it traced highly. Uh, so it understands that uh, the data um, stored in the cell is in the data one region and starts restoring it back to data one region. Right? So after like, this amount of time here shown by the restore, both the cell and sense amplifier reach like, full um, charge. Yeah, so this point is ready to access voltage uh, or ready to access like charge level. And then this basically means the memory controller is allowed after this point to issue read and write commands to the DRAM. So we call this timing here that the memory controller needs to satisfy TRCD. Um, yeah, so whenever the memory controller issues a activate command, it needs to wait at least for TRCD time, which is defined in the um, DRAM specification. Um, and after that, it can issue read or write command. So similarly, uh, when uh, similarly to ready to access charge level here, we also have ready to pre-charge um, charge level, which means after this point, the memory controller can issue a pre-charge command to close zero and open another one. So similarly, um, the timing parameter between activate and pre-charge is called TRS. Okay, yeah, so this is basically um, what happens uh, when you access a DRM. Um, are there any questions so far? Everything clear? Okay. So um, now let me try to explain uh, why it matters. Why it matters like accessing highly charged roles and like other roles that are not classified as highly charged. So this was a uh, operation where we started the cell from this level. So as you see, there's some room over here, right? So, uh, it, so the cell can have um, any charge level in this region, in data one region, which we can uh, co still correctly read the data, right? So it has some margin here to leak some charge, uh, which happens over time. So what will happen 
if instead of that level we start the cell from this highest possible level. Um, so we observe that uh, all those operations happen much faster, right? So the charge sharing completes at higher level and like it completes faster and we reach to this ready to access level um, much quicker. So it's possible to potentially issue those read uh, write commands and also pre-charge commands sooner than uh, uh, sooner than uh, the TRC and TRS value specified in the data sheet. Right? So, but here the restriction is that you have to know that the cell is at like a highest, like very, uh, very highly charged point, but it's not somewhere close to this region over here. Okay, so basically this is the difference between like accessing a highly charged role. So the same thing happens also here in data uh, zero region. Okay, so this was the first observation, right? So um, highly charged DRAM rows can be accessed with lower latency. The memory controller can tune those TRC and TRS timing parameters. And so we performed some simulations and found that we can reduce TRC by 44% and this TRS uh, by 37%. Um, so the next question we need to answer to like come up with a mechanism is uh, how does a row become highly charged, right? So how can we know that Draw currently has a very high amount of charge, so we can reduce the latencies. Uh, so there are two ways. Um, so the first is um, due to the refresh operations. So you know from yesterday that DRAM um, cells leak charge over time, and to preserve the data, uh, we need to refresh it uh, at some uh, fixed time intervals, which is typically 64 milliseconds. Um, and basically, this chart over here uh, shows that, and yeah, so here this, until this point, uh, a DRAM cell leaks some charge, and once we issue the refresh operation, we restore it back to its original value, and the same thing happens um, again and again. So another operation that restores a DRAM um, cell or DRAM row is an access, right? So when we want to access a um, specific region of a DRAM, we need to activate a row, and once we activate the row, as I showed uh, in the previous slides, it also gets restored, same as refresh. So potentially we have two operations that we can exploit to detect those highly charged rows. Yeah, so, and this is the second observation, right? So the row, a row is restored both on refresh operation and access operations. Um, okay, and, and, and the next question we try to answer is how likely is a recently accessed row access again? Um, yeah, and so we make some observations based on a um, wide range of uh, applications uh, that we uh, analyze, and we find that uh, they have very high row level temporal locality, meaning that they access a very small subset of rows continuously uh, for uh, some time window. Yeah, so a recent access row is likely to be accessed again, and we developed this um, metric here that we call TRLTL, which uh, is basically um, uh, shows the fraction of rows that are accessed within the T millisecond uh, time window um, or T time window, I think. Yeah, but yeah. Um, okay, and this chart here shows the results of our analysis on like these workloads, uh, which are from uh, SPEC 2006 uh, benchmark suite and um, also some uh, other benchmarks is like stream over here and, um, and uh, TPCH, which is uh, kind of a um, workload that is used on um, uh, like uh, server platforms. Okay, and here we basically see the eight millisecond RLTL for single core workloads for these workloads over here. Um, so as you see, on average, we have 86% RLTL, which means that 86% um, of the row activations go to rows that were previously accessed within this eight millisecond time window, right? Um, so only for this application here, we see nothing, so it's very low. And this is basically because this application benefits from the last level cache uh, pretty well, and it rarely accesses DRAM. So it's, there's almost no accesses to the DRAM uh, 
yeah, uh, due to the benefits of, of, of the cache. Okay, so we make similar observations for um, eight core workloads. It's actually much higher. So RLTL in this case is much higher. Um, and so these eight core workloads are basically, um, so we call them um, multi-programmed workloads, which means um, we use like eight of those. Um, so we randomly choose eight of those workloads, single core workloads, and put them on a separate cores, right? So we have eight cores in total. Each core is running like randomly one of those single core applications. And we see what happens in, this, in that case. And we find that our LTL is much higher. So there's much higher reuse. And this is basically because um, when you have more applications uh, demanding different roles, it's more likely that you have this um, uh, contention, this trashing effect, where let's say an application wants to stream to a row, but because of servicing access from another application, you, ac you activate um, another row from the same bank, right? And then uh, go back to the distro. So basically that switching between two rows or multiple rows is uh, more likely to happen in case where you have um, more applications running on your system. Okay, and yeah, so basically uh, now, since we like covered those uh, three observations, uh, I can start with the um, mechanism. But before that, um, yeah, again, we have here our three observations. Right? So uh, the observation about the highly charged um, cells can be accessed with low latency. Um, and then the second was that uh, we restore the charge in a cell both by accessing it and refreshing it. And the last observation was the um, RLTL. Okay, so the key idea of the mechanism is track recently accessed DRAM rows and like keep that information somewhere in the memory controller and lower the timing parameters if accesses occur to the same rows again. And so here's a uh, like an example, uh, a visual example to show you how it works. So again, so here we have the same um, like DRAM um, uh, cell array, or you can think of it as a bank here, and we have rows enumerated from um, A to F. And so this is the memory controller, and this is what we implement in the memory controller, what we add to it. Uh, so we add this table. So in this case, we have only four entries here. Uh, so let's see what happens when we uh, receive a request to a cell in row A over here. Uh, so since initially this table is empty, um, we get a charge cache miss, which means we need to use default timing parameters to activate this row and read the data, right? And then let's say we uh, get a request to row D here. So since we have row A activated, we need to pre-charge it first and then um, activate row D over here. So this is again a charge cache miss. We don't have this entry uh, inside the table. And we, yes, again, activate with default timing parameters. But when we get, again, a request to row A, so first we uh, perform a lookup here in this table, we find row A, and then we use lower timing parameters um, to like perform uh, fast access and potentially improve performance. Um, another, another operation that we have to perform in order to ensure correctness is um, to clear this table periodically. And um, that is needed because, um, um, yeah, so that is needed basically because cells leak charge over time, right? And so although we store a row here, let's say for eight milliseconds, after eight milliseconds, it won't be highly charged anymore. Or it depends where you set your um, threshold to specify a row as highly charged or not highly charged, right? Um, yeah, so if you set that threshold to eight milliseconds, we need, we need to clear this table um, at every eight milliseconds to ensure that we only store here rows that are highly charged. Yes. Yep. And if you clear it after like every like eight milliseconds, you're also gonna clear rows that are just added to the cache, right? Yes. Yes, that's true. So we have some 
Um, is it a false positive in this case? Yes, so we cleared some rows that are highly charged. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, potentially you can implement a smarter mechanism where you only clear rows that you know to have exceeded this 8 millisecond. But it's much simpler to clear everything. And we found that um, it works pretty well. So there are not like too many rows that, um, um, that are like being used for more than 8 milliseconds, let's say. Yeah. Actually, I think we use 1 millisecond, not 8. So, um, so there's a trade-off between this uh, threshold that you set to specify a row as highly charged or not highly charged, and the amount of uh, reduction in those timing parameters, TRCD and TRS. So if your threshold is high, we can reduce the timing parameters less. Yeah. Do you see why? Because um, you basically allow more room for the um, cells to leak charged. And your like lowest level is basically uh, lower when this threshold is high. So let's say if it's one millisecond, you allow it to leak very small amount of charge, right? So it's like you classify row as highly charged when it's like let's say very close to VDD. But if you make it 16 millisecond, then it potentially can leak more charge, and you need to adjust your timing parameters based on that. And basically, what we did was. Um, like testing, like sweeping those parameters and see what works better. And we found that one millisecond is pretty good because the reuse distance between those rows is very short. So even within one millisecond, um, you repeatedly activate the same rows multiple times. Um, and here we see the uh, overhead in terms of area and power consumption of the mechanism. So for area, um, we found that a uh, charge cache table with 128 entries works pretty well. And this requires only about 5 kilobytes of storage, which corresponds to 0.24% of a 4 megabyte last level cache. Um, for power consumption, we found that uh, implementing this table um, uh, increased some additional power consumption, uh, which is uh, like 0.15 um, milliwatts on average. Um, which is again uh, like 0.23% of a last level cache. So compared to a last level cache, it's a very small addition. Okay, and let me quickly go to the results that we have. So we use the simulator um, called Remulator, and we evaluate 22 different uh, single core workloads. And as I said, we create uh, 20 multi programmed eight core workloads by randomly choosing um, from those 22 single core workloads. And uh, we simulate for at least 1 billion instructions. Um, and yeah, those are the system parameters that we use. So we use either a 1-core or 8-core system with 4 megabytes LLC. And those are the default TRCD TRS values in terms of cycles. And I guess here the frequency was, um, I think, uh, 1,600. Um, I'm, I'm not exactly sure, but basically you can find what it is by um, um, dividing this to typical uh, values of TRCD and TRS. So for TRCD, it's like 13 nanoseconds, for example. And based on what is your memory controller frequency, you can find what it corresponds to in terms of cycles. OK, um, so we compare this charge cache to a previously proposed work, uh, which is um, kind of similar, uh, but um, it only exploits the refresh operations as a source for creating those highly charged rows. Right? So this mechanism only tracks those uh, refreshes to know that a row is highly charged. And um, we find that actually this is a very small fraction. This covers a very small fraction of the total available highly charged rows. Um, yeah, and this fraction is like about 10 to 12 uh, percent. So it's, it's, not, it's not a very good idea to just um, make use of uh, refreshes because most of the benefits come from the accesses. Um, yes, and yeah, when we uh, exploit accesses, we find that we can like improve this uh, detection of highly charged rows from 10% to uh, up to um, 97%. Yeah, and again, this is the um, number of entries we use. 
And on HIT, we found that we can reduce TRCD from 11 cycles to 7 cycles, and similarly TRS from 28 to 20. Um, so we also evaluate an upper bound, which is low latency DRAM. So this is basically like 100% hit rate on this table, right? So basically we always use those parameters and we do that to see the potential, right? So if you can like perfectly detect uh, the highly charged rows and exploit them perfectly, this is the upper bound you can get. Um, yeah, this works as a charge with 100% hit ratio. Okay, and yeah, so here are single performance uh, results. So here we have speed up on the y-axis and some of the applications um, on the y-axis. Uh, so those are, I guess, mostly like just um, more memory intensive applications. But here we show the average across all 22 workloads that we looked at. Uh, so this is the, uh, the speed up that uh, this other mechanism that only exploits refreshes achieves. Um, yeah, so it's about 2% on average. And this is what um, happens when we use charge cache instead. Um, and we can also use combinations of that, right? So to exploit both the refreshes and, um, and accesses to detect those highly charged rows. And it also uh, in improves the performance a little bit. And okay, finally, this is the potential. This is uh, the performance improvement with low latency DRAM. So yeah, so here we see that in like most cases, um, we can do pretty close to this um, potential for improvement. Uh, a few applications that uh, do not do very well are this MCF, which is highly memory intensive. And um, so its working set is too large. So it accesses too many rows. And basically here the problem is that this 128 entry charge cache table is not enough to store all entries accessed by this application. So potential by making the uh, table bigger, we can also achieve better performance improvement here. But that comes at the cost of hardware, right? So on average, we found that like even a small table works well for most of the applications. Um, yes, and so the first uh, for uh, the same chart for um, eight core uh, system. And so we see here that uh, we get a slightly better performance improvement uh, because we have um, more of this like trashing effect where we um, switch between rows. And this is, um, the, uh, this is the case where the charge cache provides benefits, right? So if you have very high um, row buffer hit rate uh, where you uh, open a row and then do many reads on it, right? Then you amortize this cost of activation pretty well. Um, but if you jump between rows, you switch between rows very quickly, just perform one read and then uh, go to another row. So in that case, charge cache can potentially uh, help you a lot um, because it reduces the activation latency. Okay, yeah, so on average we achieve like 9%. Uh, for this uh, eight core system. Um, so we, we can also save some uh, energy and here the benefits mainly come from the reduction in execution time, right? So we com uh, complete the application much faster. And this is only uh, reduction in DRAM energy, by the way. Um, yeah, so for eight core workloads, we can um, get about like, I think it, this was about 8%. Um, and this is the uh, max we can get if you use low latency DRAM. So we also have um, other results in the paper. Uh, so we like look at this row level temporal locality in more detail. So if you're interested, you can take a look. Um, so what are like other observations based on this metric? And so we also do a analysis on what is the hit rate of this charge cache table. And then we like basically sweep the size of this table. Uh, we change the number of entries we have and look at how this hit rate changes, which affects the uh, speed up that we uh, get. Uh, and we have some other sensitivity studies. We basically look at uh, what is the sensitivity to T in this T or LTL, which is the time window uh, we said. And yeah, as I said, we also look at uh, uh, the charge capacity. 
And yeah, so charge cache is a like mechanism to reduce the DRAM access latency without any changes in the DRAM um, chip and some small additions to the memory controller. And those are the two ob observations that we um, exploit in order to develop this mechanism. And so the key idea was to place those recent access rows in a table because we expect them to be accessed again in the near future, right? And then whenever that happens, um, we instruct the memory controller to use lower timing parameters. Yeah, so at the end, charge is a, a like low-cost mechanism that uh, doesn't require modifications to the DRAM. It improves uh, performance and also uh, DRAM energy. Um, yeah, I think that's it about this one. Any questions? Okay, um, then I will continue with the um, second one.